Chapter 23 All the Way Around Even without a watch, Cam knows his swoop across the lake had taken hours. The sun has set by the time Cam draws close to the campfire he saw earlier, turning the wisp of smoke into a single star in the deep. Although there are real stars above, great swaths of them, galaxies and nebulas, multicolored, they do little to help Cam see details at the ground level. They also mean I'm nowhere near civilization, Cam had lamented. Cam's hands had been raw on the wooden oars before he'd even finished his straight-line escape from the ooze monsters. For a while, Cam had feared that they might never give up the chase. He'd passed the jungle island and could still see them spitting eagerly in his direction. To his great relief, though, the monsters did eventually lose sight of him. They stopped spitting, and when Cam turned the boat as a test, they didn't track him from shore. The building to Cam's right had been a dire silhouette, backlit by the setting sun as Cam had rode past it. That way is west, then, he'd thought. Forests and barn to the northeast, mountains to the south, and this river runs north to south, mostly. In the forest, at the spot where Cam had found the boat, the river ran east to west. Then it turned left beside the meadow where he had first woken up. Cam had logged this information in his head. Any of it could be life-saving down the line, despite his plan to never, ever return to that forest, the barn, or any of the surrounding meadow. As for the building, light blue walls with dirt and grime that had seemed more on the surface than dirt and grime ever are. Superficial, a mobile phone to be wiped with a finger. Cam had reason that the poor lighting could have been throwing him off. Still, the building was strange. Cam had never seen such a gargantuan wall without a single window, and the crumbling edge of it leading to drowned linoleum and the pitch-black throat of a hallway. Just one look had been enough to convince Cam to row in the opposite direction. With his boat approaching the campfire, Cam rose stealthily, spacing out his strokes. At the closest possible spot that he feels he could row away safely if someone came swimming after him, he calls out. Hey, you at the campfire. Tell me who you are. A long silence follows. Wavelets lap the sides of Cam's boat. We're armed, but we won't hurt you if you don't try to hurt us. There are monsters to the north. We want to tell you about them. Authoritative, dangerous, but open to negotiation. Calling himself we was a last-second invention, but Cam likes the way it sounded. Unfortunately, it yields no response. Hey! Hey! Wake up! If there are monsters nearby, shouldn't you be a little quieter? A voice calls through the blackness. I know that voice. Cam thinks, excited despite his efforts to stay suspicious, stay alert. Are you armed? He replies, as softly as he can. Yes, we fucking are. A second voice, also familiar. Although the knowledge that he's outnumbered makes Cam glad for the water between him and the other humans, part of him feels ready to let his guard down. He knows these people. But who are they? Co-workers? Cam is in office attire. Stay focused. The stress could be screwing with you. How good is the brain at identifying people by their voices anyway, when there are no context clues? Listen, we don't need to fight. I just want to talk. That's it. My name is Cam. Jesus. A sigh from the louder man, the meaning of which is unclear to Cam. I thought it sounded like you. It's Tim and Daniel. Come ashore. Friends from a past reality. The three men lived in Massachusetts and had known each other for years. Cam's immediate reaction is shock. What are they doing here? he thinks, despite the fact that Daniel and Tim's presence in this place is no less disturbing than Cam's own. Somehow, finding Daniel and Tim is forcing Cam to reconfront the mere concept of waking up in an unknown place. It's the base level of a pyramid of fears, something that fighting and fleeing had made Cam forget. Even if the monsters were kittens and the barn full of food, this one thought, How did I get here? would be justification enough for terror. Whatever took me also took whoever was near me at the time, Cam thinks. I was probably hanging out with them. But where? What were we doing? Cam rows until his boat hits land. Like everywhere else along the river and lake, there's a miniature cliff instead of a beach. 
with the boat's rope in his left hand and the garden hoe in his right, Cam disembarks. His tentacle knife is burrowed in the back of his pants, poised for a quick draw. Hey, says Daniel with a laugh, as if Cam has walked in on something ridiculous. Like Cam, both of the other men are in their mid-twenties, and both are brandishing makeshift weapons. The similarities end there, though. Daniel and Tim have stripped down to their underwear, which helps give Cam an idea of what their bodies have been through. Although Tim has kept his head clean-shaven for years, the shine of his scalp has evolved. It's hard to tell where the bruise ends and the burn begins. In his hand is a spiny shield, like a giant bug's shell. Another one for Animal Planet? Cam thinks. Daniel looks even worse, with a nasty gash on his torso and another on his thigh. A couple of improvised bandages, made out of pieces of shirt and a ropey material, wait anxiously on the grass nearby. Like Tim, Daniel is holding a carapace shield, but he's also bearing a sword-like rock. Cam puts down the rope and stakes the metal end of his garden hoe through the loop. Should be enough to keep the boat from drifting. After seeing Cam drop his weapon, Daniel and Tim do the same with theirs, and then Daniel begins bandaging his wounds. A beat passes. Cam stares at his feet, thinking. Then he removes the knife hidden in the back of his pants and puts it on the ground as well. With Daniel and Tim no longer gripping shields, Cam can see one more thing that he and they have in common. All three men are sporting the same wound on their left thumbs. Whoa, you guys got bit too. Tim did the biting, says Daniel. He chewed off part of his own thumb, and that transferred to us. Don't ask me how. You bit off your own thumb? Why? Good fucking question. An evil kitchen sink was going to fucking kill me, but then I bit my thumb instead, and I passed out. He's explained it to me before. I don't think it makes sense either. Okay, hang on. Maybe we need to start at the beginning. Don't you want to tell us about the monsters first? Asks Daniel, putting another knot in the bandage around his leg. Do we need to put out the fire? Uh, yeah, maybe at least until morning. In the river up north, there are these things that look like dogs, but have tentacles. And a knife. Cam gestures to the bladed tentacle on the ground. Fuck. Groans Tim. I didn't see any except right by the jungle but they could be in the lake, too. There are also these piles of organs. Yeah, by the barn. I locked those fuckers out. Don't tell me you tried fighting them. No, I ran. They spit ooze at my boat for, I don't know, could have been over an hour. I don't understand how they can create so much of that stuff. There's a giant beetle in the tunnel down south that vomits pure fire. No chemicals. Nothing here makes any fucking sense. How can you be sure there were no chemicals? Well, we got pretty close to the damn thing, says Daniel. All right, there's one more monster I saw. It runs fast and spews poison behind it. Kind of looks like a horse. Tim sighs and looks at the ground. We need to move. All in favor of taking your boat to the island? Can the used things swim? Uh, definitely not the slow ones, but the horse might be able to. I agree about the island. At least there we would hear the splashing before anything hit us. Assuming there isn't anything already there. Daniel points out. Yeah, true. 